Good evening, friends and comrades, everyone that's joining this Zoom call tonight. My name is Shelley Asquith. I'm from the Stop the War Coalition. I'll be your host for this evening. We're obviously only one minute in, so we're not going to start immediately. We're just going to give it a few minutes for latecomers to make their way on in. We've got some fantastic speakers that we're going to hear from this evening. I'm really excited to introduce them all and I'm sure you're very excited to hear from them as well. Now, just to let you know, we are going to have time to ask some questions after everybody's kind of given their contribution. So please do make use of the Q&A or chat function on the Zoom call if that's how you're tuning in. I can see people already posting in there saying good evening, good evening to you to David and everybody else. And as I say at the end, I will do my best to pick out some of your questions and, and uh, put them to our panelists or, or your contributions as well if you've got discussion points that you wanna add to tonight's conversation. You can see people are pouring in in their hundreds, which is fantastic to see. It's obviously, very crucial, also very timely discussion on Yemen tonight. So for those who've joined since I last did it, my name's Shelley. I'm one of the national officers for Stop the War Coalition and I'll be your host and chair this evening. I'll just crack off crack on by doing a bit of a, a general overview of, of the situation to kind of introduce the meeting tonight before we move on to hear from our fantastic panellists. Now, this is about the, the war in Yemen and sort of the war's demand for the British government to stop arming Saudi Arabia. The Saudi regime being one of the most brutal and authoritarian anywhere in the world and the main player in the terrible war on Yemen. In just over five years, the Saudi-led war has devastated most infrastructure and killed tens of thousands of people. At the start of this year, the death toll stood at 100,000 with 3 million displaced, eight and a half million unable to say where their next meal was coming from. The UN has warned that 13 million could die as a, as a result of the war on Yemen. That was before the deadly coronavirus crisis hit, before it reached a country where more than 70 health facilities have been destroyed by a series of airstrikes conducted by the Saudi Arabian-led coalition since 2015. Aid agencies warn that if the war continues, it will cause the worst humanitarian catastrophe since the Second World War. Yet the British government continues to back the regime. Early this month, the government announced it was resuming arms export licensing to Saudi and its allies. Our government remains close to Saudi Arabia because they buy more British bonds than anywhere else in the world. In a single year, the UK approved more than 3.3 billion in military sales to Saudi. And they remain close because it has long been a key ally in a region that the West is desperate to control. It has long opposed regimes and movements that have challenged Western power in the region and helped guarantee a flow of Middle Eastern oil to the West. Our government doesn't care at what cost that comes, that relationship. Their previous calls to back a ceasefire were absolutely meaningless when they continue to arm the war and turn a blind eye to the devastation caused and their own deadly role in it. This is a dangerous moment and it is a really crucial one for us as anti-war activists in this country to get vocal and to get active around. Now Stop the War Coalition aims to pile pressure on the government to drop arms sales immediately. We do this through protests, we do it through petitioning and through meetings like this one, which we like to do in real life, of course, uh, but we have to do online in the current crisis. And I have to say, any uh, usual offline meeting would not have the kind of attendance that we're seeing tonight. So it's fantastic to see so many of you here tonight. 
I'm delighted to first welcome as our first speaker this evening an inspiring young activist who's been central to organising the recent March for Yemen demonstrations. His name is Isa Ali. Isa, it's over to you. Hi everyone. Um, I just wanted to say um, thank you all for joining tonight. Um, it's been a it's been a good few weeks organising protests, but obviously I wanted to say my thing on this take on this war. Well, this bullying on a country. Let's not call it a war. The world's worst humanitarian crisis in Yemen has been going on for more than five years. British weapons are doing most of the killing every single day. Yemen is hit with British bombs dropped by British planes, flown by British trained pilots and maintained in Saudi Arabia by British contractors. Saudi Arabia leads a coalition within Britain and other Arab countries in, in, in the Middle East, targeting innocent civilians, women and children in a widespread systematic manner. It's disgusting. And our British government does nothing but merely supply arms. But not only, but it supplies the expertise, the personnel, and the people that can actually train the engineers and pilots out there, the key targeteers. But why? Our question as to, is, is to why our government is annihilating a country that has done nothing to them. It's simple. Killing and murdering its civilians and all to do is all to do with money. Arms trading is the world's most successful business with one bomb costing as little as £100,000. And imagine how many we are. Just last week, the UK signed a multi-billion pound investment of arms to Saudi. And again, we ask why. Well, one huge reason is the government needs to pay. Due to coronavirus and no money being made to pay the UK citizens, the government must find a way to pay. And, our shock, and to our shock, they choose the most inhumane way to make money by killing the matter of people in Yemen. But under British law, it is illegal to license armed exports if they might be used to deliberately or recklessly against, used against civilians. And how we would normally say to violate humanitarian law. And nobody seems to know this, nobody seems to care. So if people are using this as an excuse to harm and, ab and abuse and bully a country as small as Yemen with a backing of the most powerful countries in the world and then naturally no one would actually talk about it because in our eyes we just think because we are the powerful we are doing nothing wrong so this is where we come in and the people that want to make a change and actually do something come in and help um, we have become a country as a primary source of supplying arms and nothing else and that way we are making money to keep our citizens happy, but bullying and murdering other countries and other citizens in different parts of the world, most, mostly at the moment, Yemen, and led by Saudi Arabia and the other Middle East countries. So here we come in as an organization, myself and my team have worked to create a platform where we, well, us are in, in the UK who are Yemenis or backgrounds who, um, or, or just Middle Eastern backgrounds who think that what or who know what's going on in Yemen is the wrong thing to do. But the fact is that until recently, the world actually shed no light on this at all. Hence why we came in as our organization to start spreading awareness and gaining media attention and actually telling the world, the UK, well, starting from, starting from your own street to London, to Manchester, to the whole of the UK, what actually the UK is doing in their part of playing in this war, this abusive bullying to Yemen, alongside Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Middle East. And this politically turned war has turned into the death of more than 100,000 people for the past five years. And now COVID has hit, and now they're all going to die. The country is basically gonna be extinct or wiped out. And the fact that nobody knew about it was the issue in my eyes that was annoying me. So, my team and I created protests, how we had, we were quite inspired by the um, movements of other organizations happening just a few months before. And we thought, wow, you know what, this is working. This is getting, this is, the message is getting across. Everyone's listening, people are learning. And the fact is that we just wanted to educate with what was going on. And when I first organized the protest, I was happy to see that I was working with a team of people around the UK that were actually doing the same thing as me. Um, we had people in Liverpool, people in Birmingham, people in Manchester, Sheffield, who were actually doing the same thing as me, which I didn't actually know about. People were, um, like some people in this um, panel as well, like Amina, we were organising protests and other things that we can do where people can come and um, spread light across this situation by 
power and numbers. And that was the best way to go about it, of course. And not only did that we, we did we have that, but we had our charity running as well. And yes, my main aim was to spread awareness and get the media attention and show the UK what they are actually doing in killing the Yemenis. But not only that, we were working with our um, charity online that we created called Ana Al Watan. And that way we were starting to, we were raising money and making awareness, spreading awareness and getting attention all at the same time. And with that, we managed to raise over the course of my protests, we managed to raise just over £3,000. So that will all go straight to our coordinators who are actually based in Sana'a and Aden. And what's amazing is that through the power of the people and the power of the words, BBC and other big platforms have managed to actually finally shed some light on this um, turn of events in Yemen, which has actually been going on for the past five years. But um, they only really decided to say something now. And um, it's been a it's been a it's been a rough ride. People have been backing us. People have been not backing us. People have been supportive and unsupportive. And I'm sure any of the people on the panel can agree that it's been a very difficult one to actually try and shed light on the people in the Middle East and especially in somewhere on the other side of the world where this Western country wants to control. And it will not be it will be an extremely hard job to show the world what a country like us, who's powerful, and in the Western world would want to do with a country in the Middle East who have merely nothing as much as we do. So within that, gaining the numbers, having more than thousands of people attending my protests, which was, was the best way to get our message across, and finally shedding some light on what's going on. But what our government and what our, because they work quite closely with the media, I'm sure everyone's aware and everyone knows, is that they actually didn't tell the world in the UK what they were actually doing. They blamed the death of millions of children and women and men in Yemen on coronavirus. But no country has lost millions of lives to coronavirus yet. So how can that be true? How can that be real? It doesn't make sense to me. So the only way to show the world that death in Yemen was actually because of bombs and killing and not because of coronavirus was to shed light during these protests, these panels, these organizations to show the world what we're actually doing. Any sort of word is the best kind of word and power in numbers really. The more people that know what we're, what's going on there, the better the outcome is for us. And so far it's started to work. So we organized four protests, each one increasing in numbers, obviously some days better than others. But the fact is that more and more people were knowing about them, spreading awareness, getting their messages across. And gladly we have um, used the whole of July and just the end of June to really promote this this as a bigger cause and it's become massive now and people are really starting to listen. And at the end of August, early September, we have another one in London organised. Um, I know I've been working in partners with um, people in Birmingham, people in Sheffield, people in Manchester, Liverpool, um, in organising their own ones for their own cities for Yemen. Um, but luckily for me, I was the one in charge for London and I'm glad to say that we have one more organised at the end of September, uh, sorry, at the beginning of um, September, end of August time, roughly around that time, where we can actually finally make it a bigger one and a better one. And within that time, in the whole of August, we're going to be doing nothing but fundraising, organising events and raising more money for the needy and the poor in Yemen. Because whilst, whilst they're fighting with their arms and their money, we can do the same in terms. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Issa. I think that's a really important point you made towards the end there about the way that COVID-19 is being used as a smokescreen, um, yeah. you know, to, to hide, hide the deaths that are clearly as a result of the war. Um, and it's so brilliant to hear about the work you've been doing, you know, raising thousands of pounds, but also mobilising thousands of people um, and amplifying the issue so that it kind of gets in the media. And I think it's been really good as well to see lots more people talking about this on social media, particularly young people. As I say, I saw you doing an Instagram a live uh, yeah. discussion about this the other day um, and I think it, it just a show, it makes it aware that you're doing all the more important that particularly young people but you know just bigger audiences in general are taking uh, taking note of what's going on um, it's great to see some of the comments coming through in the chat on, on the zoom we've got activists from uh, Belfast Aberdeen Southampton Cornwall right across the country uh, and various stop the war groups around the country represented tonight coming in as well Yasmin says hi all I'm a Yemeni American activist living 
in beautiful Edinburgh. So grateful to see this has been organised and to see the incredible support from across the UK. I couldn't agree more with you, Yasmin. There's some links being posted to the Stop the War petition, uh, links to join the war. I would encourage anyone who can, can do so to join. Uh, and Ethan, if you might be able to post a link to the protest in September that you just mentioned, that would be really uh, good as well, so okay. people can find out more information. Our next speaker is a fellow National Officer of Stop the War Coalition with me. It's been a key anti-war activist for many years, particularly on Palestine and on Yemen. It's a pleasure to introduce Steve Bell. Uh, the, the floor, the screen rather, Steve, is yours. Thanks, Shelley. Um, <clears throat> since March 2015, the British government has supported the Saudi-led coalition's war upon Yemen. The supposed justification for the war was to restore the government of ex-president Hardy. He had been installed in a single candidate election in 2012 with a mandate that was expired in 2014. He had agreed to create a national dialogue in Yemen leading to a new inclusive government and constitution. That was the hope of millions of Yemenis who took part in the countrywide uprisings in 2011. Yemen's own Arab Spring, but Hardy had failed by the end of his mandate. The grievances of Yemenis weren't met and there was no new government or constitution. In the north of the country, the popular committees of Ansar Allah took over large parts in denouncing the corruption of the old regime. Elsewhere in the country, other popular militias established local power bases similarly. Perhaps a new popular government would have emerged if the Yemeni people had been left to resolve their own problems. But for the Gulf monarchies, the idea of Republican Yemenis moving to establish a radical new government was unacceptable. The Saudi and uh, United Arab Emirates regimes had opposed all the uprisings of the Arab Spring in Tunisia, Egypt and elsewhere. The Saudis and Emiratis had invaded Bahrain in 2011 to support the royal dictatorship's suppression of the Bahraini people. The Saudis had a long record of intervening in Yemen. They invaded in the 1930s, intervened regularly in the 1960s and intervened again in 2009. This time in 2015, the Saudis and Emiratis invaded with the political diplomatic, military and logistical support of the U US and British governments. Indeed, the invasion and siege of Yemen would not have been possible without that support. Nearly all the coalition planes are of US and British manufacture, the missiles and munitions similarly so. So what has been achieved in more than five years of war against the poorest Arab majority nation by some of the richest states in the world? Most obviously, the Saudi coalition has failed to restore ex-President Hardy's government. Indeed, Hardy has so little support that he is unable to live in Yemen. He and many of his ministers are still in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia's capital. Almost equally as obvious, the Saudi coalition has failed to achieve any of its military objectives. The large majority of the population live in areas outside of coalition control. Since the summer of 2015, the coalition has won no ground. In fact, in the last year, the coalition has lost considerable ground. So the coalition has been unsuccessful in its war aims and has been unsuccessful in its military campaign. But the failure is even more complete. The forces armed and supported by the Saudis and Emiratis are regularly engaging each other in military conflict. After five years, the coalition is at war with itself. Unfortunately, the actual results of the war have not led the British government to review its policy. As has already been indicated by ESA, the British government has decided to resume arms sales to the coalition. This just continues the futile attempt to impose a military solution. The victims of this comprehensive failure is the Yemeni people. Yesterday, the United Nations Security Council heard reports from officials on the ground. 
Martin Griffiths, who is leading UN mediation efforts, reported that no agreement has been reached on the measures needed for a ceasefire. He went further, saying that there was a real risk of current negotiations slipping away, leading to a prolonged escalation. Of course, his position would not allow him to report that the US and UK governments continued to support for the war is undermining the possibility of a Yemen-led peace process. Yesterday also, Mark Lowcock, the UN official responsible for the humanitarian program in Yemen, also reported to the Security Council. For some years now, as Issa said, the UN has recognized that Yemen is the worst humanitarian catastrophe in the world. Lowcock reported that with 80% of the population already uh, requiring humanitarian relief, the situation is getting dramatically worse. For five years, the coalition has imposed a siege by land, sea and air. At the moment, the coalition is preventing a large number of tankers from entering Hodeida port, despite UN verification that these ships contain no arms. The ships do contain fuel, medicines, food and essential items. According to Lokok, this has created a serious fuel shortage. As a result, there is, this has led to a doubling of the price of water. Yemen has an acute water shortage already. It has led to an escalation of food prices. Yemen imports 90% of its food staples. It has led to aid agencies lacking fuel and thus being unable to travel to communities in need. Locott reported that the UN's aid program is, quote, on the verge of collapse. Aid agencies have only received 18% of the aid needed for this year. He reported that the UN had already halved rations to 8 million people. In September, he is anticipating closing 400 health facilities serving 9 million people. He said that the main reason for the fall in resources is because of, quote, a sharp drop in pledges and payments from Gulf countries this year. So much for the coalition caring for the fate of the Yemeni people. The Saudis and Emiratis have no difficulty in financing the war purchasing new military hardware from the US and UK. But there is a drop in funds to feed a country facing famine, COVID, cholera, and the collapse of its economy. The International Monetary Fund anticipates fragile states like Yemen will lose nearly a third of their GDP this year. The desperate people of Yemen are facing a loss of a third of their meager income. The British government is ignoring the humanitarian failure. By renewing arms sales, the British government is, in practice, continuing to promote a military solution over a political solution. The Stop the War Coalition believes that there cannot be a military solution to this war. Only the Yemeni people can decide a real future for the country. The British government must not supporting an arm at must stop supporting and arming the coalition. It must withdraw all military, British military personnel from the Saudi command center. It must end its training of the coalition's army, navy and air forces. Stop the war is committed to building united action to secure an end to the British government's involvement. We greatly welcome the contribution of act young activists like Issa and Amina who taking this message further and we are pledged to united action with the new generation of activists to do what we can to end this terrible and futile war. Thank you. Thank you so much Steve. I can see Issa's clapping. Um, and just a reminder that we're all young. 
it's not just uh, Issa and Amina. Um, and I'm really, really grateful for that really thorough and detailed insight. And I think it's such an important point about aid and you know the deliberate denial of medicine, food and water to Yemenis. I think it's really important to always remember that war isn't only waged with bombs. Starvation is also a tactic of warfare and this is murder and it's murder where our own government has blood on its hands. Um, I've, I just want to uh, read out a comment that I saw in the chat which came from Carol who said what is happening in Yemen uh, would just be ignored if organisations like Stop the War weren't keeping it in the forefront of people's minds and organising events like this. Stop the War don't receive funds from anywhere else so rely on public membership and donations. Carol I couldn't have said it better than myself thanks for that um, and, and just a reminder for people to please join Stop the War if you haven't already. Our next fantastic speaker describes herself as a Yemeni Scouse activist. She's a poet uh, who's been involved in organising recent protests in Liverpool it's a pleasure to introduce Amina Atik. Hi guys, you're all right. Didn't expect that, did you? Strong accent. <laughs> um, yeah, just want to say thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Issa and Steve have really laid out some of the most important um, things that we have been saying probably for the last five to six years now. Um, I wanted to kind of like, um, just to correct something, I've not organised any protests, I don't want to take any of the credit recently. Um, however, for the last five years, I've been involved with Li Liverpool Friends of Yemen. And um, Jeremy Corbyn actually attended one of our visuals uh, about two years ago, which was amazing to see alongside so many other local MPs. Um, and um, so I have been really highly um, kind of involved from a very young age. So when the war began in Yemen, I was 19 years of age. I wasn't very politically engaged. Um, it was only until the war in Yemen began that I really thought maybe we can re really do something here. And, um, and our local MPs and um, obviously, of course, Jeremy Corbyn has allowed young people to to believe that there's definitely a voice in politics for everyone. Um, so I'm going to start off and I want to really bring something different to the table. Um, obviously we're here to talk about the UK's relationship with the Saudi-led coalition. Um, our government has admitted that it supports, it, um, it gives spare parts, it maintains, it gives technical advice and it resupplies. They've admitted to that, they've kind of made it clear what it is exactly they do. However, I feel like I need to change the language here coming from a language um, career. Um, it is a collaboration. The government, our British government, is not maintaining anything. They are collaborating. They are resupplying because it is for financial reasons. If our British government is making a multi billionaire profit, then it is just a business transaction. And it can be more than that. But we really need to start changing the language when we speak about our British government. Um, as a Yemeni um, British, I'm really disappointed. I'm disappointed in my British government, who has allowed this, who has not just allowed this war to continue, but to actually fuel it, fuel it and support it. Um, according to the UN, there's about 233,000 people um, who would be killed by 2020. Um, and because I am a creative and I believe in every statistic, there's a face and a name to that Yemeni child, women and men. These people are not statistics. Um, these people are people. And now that we are in COVID, the whole world is grieving. People have lost family members and more than ever, the whole world is really reflecting. And I just hope that we don't go into the seventh or eighth year uh, of um, because uh, some Yemeni people believe that the war started before 2015 um, and um, I just hope we don't go to, to another year um, so I'm going to read something just to kind of like give us a, a human voice into the statistics and just to kind of bring compassion back into politics um, and so this is about the 12 year old boy with 23 surgeries a battle with uh, Kalura. All his tragedies come from war. All his tragedies are our silence. It's about a doctor, unheard, warning of the reality of the situation he witnesses between the hospital four walls and then his life ended in cholera. Now they will face the challenge of coronavirus and they are. 
It is the daughter who lost her husband on her wedding night when an airstrike um, hit the wedding call and killed her husband to be. It is for history to remember and for you to be part of that history. And in the last five years, it's become so difficult for the Yemeni people to survive because they are no longer living. They are only trying to survive. And as I remember the school bus with school children that never made it back home, dozens were killed and school bags stained left for the world to witness. And as I remember the 50 year old woman fighting for her life with cholera and heart disease um, ravaged her body and with the right health she was saved. And that's 50% of health facilities that are failing. And as I remember the most vulnerable of children and health workers who put their lives at risk and we are trapped between fighting parties in Yemen. And there is uh, my 14 year old cousin who was stabbed in the neck uh, from a, miss, um, a piece of a, um, um, a missile with no invitation stamped and made in Britain and they could not do it without us. The Saudi led coalition could not do this war without us because every child that plays with a, a, a fragment of a missile that is found on Yemeni land it does not say made in Yemen or made by Houthis. It says made in Britain, made in the USA. That's what a child will remember. Um, and as Steve said, um, the Yemeni people need to, they want to kind of, they want to, they're very confused and tired. My mum just returned from Yemen recently and I said, um, oh my mum, what, what's Yemen? What's Yemen like? She said, people are tired and confused. They have no hope left. For six years now, their resilience is running out. Um, and she said that people are no longer living. Um, people are really on their deathbeds and people cannot afford to eat. People are running out of their savings. Um, and, um, and yes, Yemen is more than the picture that I painted. With war and missiles, there is, there is definitely still resilience and there's definitely still hope somewhere and there is definitely an artist painting across the streets of Yemen and a candle on one hand and a flying dove hoping one day they will return to a dignified life without war and trauma and I just want to go back to 2015 where 130 civilians were killed bombing a wedding reception December the 3rd 2015 um, 15, the attack of the hospital in Tez, wounding two hospital staff. October 2016, 150 civilians were killed where an American made bombs on a funeral was hit near Sana'a. 2016, a blind school was attacked. August 2018, 44 children and 10 adults were killed. Um, and the Saudi led, all they care about is minimizing the risk to their troops. Um, but that has resulted in the thousands of civilians and has crushed the Yemeni's economy, which has led to starvation. Um, and now I'm just going to jump to um, something else, which is a lot of British people um, who have stood next to the Yemeni community um, have really, um, especially our local MPs for the past six months, they've been kind of organizing online events trying to speak to the Yemeni community but I I feel like some of the Labour MPs they don't have a lot of guidance into what they should do and I feel like there's a lack of communication with our current government and Labour MPs and um, and I a lot of people ask me what is it that we can do Amina what is it that we can do we've signed letters we're, we're fundraising and I've created a little list for, for my for our viewers today um, what the possible things that you can do to help. Um, firstly, politicians and your le local MPs, we voted, there, we voted for them for a reason and our local councillors. Do pressurise them. They are here to serve you and your concerns. If you, know, if you have a majority of a Yemeni community, support your Yemeni activists and campaigners who are already on the front line. The Yemeni community has never, has never really been involved in British politics until into the last three years. I've never seen so many Yemeni people attend 
um, a protest in the last five years. And it's so inspiring to see because now the Yemeni community have been heard and now it's time for us to really support them. And the reason why we should be supporting Yemeni activists and campaigners is because firstly, they have direct contact to Yemen. They've got direct contact to families and friends. They understand a little bit of the dynamic of the war, not politically, but in a language that we understand um, that is accessible. Um, the other thing is the war has gone wrong. Saudi, the Saudi-led coalition knows um, that it's, um, it needs to surrender because the Yemeni people need to sort out their local affairs and we need to get rid of the invaders from our backyards. Um, and that is the mission before we start talking about um, any political action or peace process. The invaders need to come out of our backyards. We cannot sort out Yemen until the Saudi-led coalition exits and closes the door on Yemen because the Yemeni people do not know what is going to happen next. And now with coronavirus, um, apparently in Sana'a um, hospital, the Houthis have been, um, there's a rumour going around saying that they're actually not exposing the real um, numbers of um, deaths of coronavirus. But a lot of people don't understand if Yemen becomes weak, this will only give the Saudi-led coalition a more of a reason to attack Yemen. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of things going on in Yemen. It's a lot of complex. My mum, to get back from Yemen to the UK with a British passport, it cost her about £2,500 and it, it took her four days of travelling. And that is what life looks like with a blockade. This is not just coronavirus, this is a blockade. So we should be helping by lifting the blockade. Sorry, I'm very loud and I'm very scouse. <laughs> um, the other thing is, I also think we also um, need to connect with the Yemeni journalists who are on the ground in Yemen. As we're speaking, they're being persecuted by both sides of the war. Um, they are being silenced, whether, whatever side they are they are in. Um, Matawanna is a, um, an organization based in Yemen who is basically trying to um, kind of raise awareness on Yemeni activists, writers who are being detained in Yemen. Um, this war, war is not just two sides. War is starvation. People are weaponizing food. This is the reality of Yemen. The Yemeni people are not afraid of missiles anymore. They are afraid of where to get their food. Um, and this is sad. This is a sad reality. So when we say 233,000 people have, are going to die by 2020, I'm talking about 233,000 souls, human beings with eyes and noses and mouths and hands and legs. This is what we're talking about. And the war needs to end. The war needs to end. The Yemeni community, alongside our local MPs and campaigners and activists, we are tired. We are absolutely tired. And this war needs to stop. And I'm only getting emotional because it's not about pity. It's about the fact that we've allowed for this to continue. The Yemeni people can't wait. Oh, gosh. Can't wait. Um, so thank you for listening to me. Um, let's just bring compassion back to politics. Um, the Yemeni people won't admit it because they are people of dignity. And just one last thing um, to the supporters of the Saudi regime, because you always get the enemy who watches and lurks around the corners. Um, you are an invader in my home. And the Yemeni people, when they invite you into our land, it is an honour. But when you are uninvited, it is disrespectful. And the Yemeni people, in their nature, they will forgive you, but they will never forget. And I will definitely not forget. Thank you. Wow, Amina. <laughs> that was amazing. And I feel a bit emotional as well. I just say, never apologise for being loud, for being scouts for doing what you're doing, because you're brilliant. Um, and I just want to read what Eleanor said. You're brilliant, Amina, very clear in your points. You've greatly helped my co comprehension of the situation. Um, and I think that a lot of people, uh, I can see a lot of comments coming in just saying how fantastic that was. Um, I think you've probably moved a lot of us. Yours are so powerful, you know, just from as simple as get the invaders out to the kind of imagery that I think has really stuck with me. You know, you're talking about the school bag stained with the blood, um, the bombs with the Made in Britain stamps on, um, and uh, as powerful as words are, you know, actions 
are so powerful as well. And it was great to get some really practical tips from you about what people should be doing, whether it's supporting the Yemeni community on the ground, writing to MPs, you know, building the anti-war movements locally where they are, building the protests. The more that we do this, the more that we can make people aware. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and for everything that you're doing. And, and I'm sure that if I could reach out through the screen, give you a hug, um, but I'm sure our paths will cross um, on, on the streets at some point as well. Um, Moving on to our final speaker, I'm really honoured to introduce a most wonderful friend and comrade, a former chair of the Stop the War Coalition, who uh, this week has been a leading voice in condemning the government's decision to resume arms sales to Saudi. Um, and while it's a, a great injustice that he is not leading the country, because if he were, Britain would no longer be selling arms to Saudi, frankly, but particularly at a time of a, a, you know, gro global crises that are costing lives. It is a, a great relief to many of us that he continues to lend his voice to the crucial causes both here and around the world, and um, just as he's done so consistently on issues of peace and social justice for the last 30 years. It is, of course, Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy, it's over to you. Thanks for being here tonight. Shelley, thank you very much and thank you for the way you're chairing this meeting and thank you to Stop the War for organising it and for all the people from all over the country, indeed all over the world, that have come onto this call this evening. Thank you and welcome and particularly to the Yemeni people in Yemen, in this country or in other places around the world. Thank you for coming on the call and our hearts are with you and we want to support you in what you're trying to achieve, which is peace and ability to bring up your children in a safe way. Amina, please never apologize for being emotional. You were absolutely brilliant in what you said and you were brilliant when I was alongside you at the vigil that we organized in Liverpool when the uh, Labour Party conference was on there and I was honored to be invited to it and very pleased to come along and be able to speak alongside you and many others to show support for the community in Liverpool and of course elsewhere. There's so much that's been said but so much that we've got to understand and do. This is the biggest humanitarian crisis anywhere in the world. Just remember that, the biggest anywhere in the world at the present time. 80%, 80% of the people of Yemen need humanitarian aid and assistance in some form at the present time. COVID-19 has made it worse but is not the sole cause of the problems of the people of Yemen. COVID-19 has exposed the problems of the people of Yemen just as it's exposed injustice, health inequality and poverty all over the world and the greed of corporations and governments that have underfunded health services and exposed those that have done the right thing and properly funded their health services and properly acted on World Health Organization advice to deal with COVID-19. But even if there was a government all across Yemen to deal with COVID-19, they lack the resources to do it at the present time. But there isn't, there is a war going on. Eight million Yemeni children are not in school or getting much education at the present time. Two million, two million under fives are malnourished in Yemen. And a malnourished under five year old means that child's cognitive development will not take place. That child will have stunted growth. That child will be smaller, weaker, and have a lower life expectancy because. They haven't had, quite bluntly, enough to eat or enough clean water or enough medical support in the very, very important growing years. The report very recently of July the 20th of 113 regions across Yemen showed that 40% of the population are food insecure. That's 80% need help and support in their humanitarian needs. 40% are hungry at the present time. And food production in Yemen 
is down by 50% year on year. Cereal production and other production is down year on year. And despite the UN's demand for two and a half billion pounds of aid to go to Yemen, less than half of that was pledged. And as Steve quite correctly pointed out, rather less than 50% uh, of that has actually been achieved or delivered at the present time. And so the situation is absolutely dire. Now, I've outlined some of the issues of um, the problems that the people of Yemen are facing, but add to that the presence of cholera and diarrhea. Children in Yemen are dying from cholera, dying from diarrhea. Now, just think about that for a moment. Cholera is a wholly preventable waterborne disease. Wholly preventable because you can have a sewage system, you can have a proper drainage system, you can have clean water. Foul water, dirty food, poor living environment leads to diarrhea. And you know what? It's the poorest and the weakest that suffer first and die because of dehydration as a result of it. So before our very eyes, people are dying from cholera, malnutrition, hunger, and diarrhea, all of which are totally and wholly preventable. At the start of the corona crisis, which was um, January of this year, not that long ago, less than six months ago. Not money, did it, did, please. I don't want any money. finished, last, that's after this finish. Hello? Hi, okay. At the early, earlier part of this year, Antonio Guterres, the General Secretary of the United Nations, issued an appeal and he was absolutely right to do to do so and i was very pleased to be able then as leader of the labor party and of the opposition to support his appeal for a global ceasefire in all conflicts in order to save lives and deal with the corona crisis and start dealing with things in a more serious way sadly there was words of good good luck and good wishes to him from many people but the war carried on. Now the wars don't happen in a vacuum. They happen because there are protagonists, they happen because there are interests at stake of resources, of land grab, of financial gain, of reward, of control. There are many, many causes of war, all of which can be approached and properly dealt with. But there's also the wherewithal to fight wars. Where does that come from? Because what I've outlined about Yemen is a country in desperate poverty, in desperate need of humanitarian support. Our government provides through the Department of International Development quite a lot of aid, humanitarian aid, which is designed to help people get through the crisis. I have absolutely no problem with that. I'm sure nobody on this call has any problem with that. But there is something completely missing. You cannot, on the one hand, be a wealthy country like Britain, providing humanitarian aid through the former Department of International Development, now sadly merged as part of the Foreign Office, then at the same time, grant export licenses to Saudi Arabia to bomb the people of Yemen and to kill them with weapons that we provide. So on the one hand, we're providing aid to support the victims of war, and at the same time, we're providing the wherewithal to promote the war and the conflict that goes with it. And so there has to be a change. And that's what this meeting is all about. When I became leader of the Labour Party in 2015, I set out my objectives on foreign policy, which was that I wanted to lead a country and a government whose watchword would be human rights, whose watchword would be environmental sustainability, whose watchword would be ending global inequality and poverty, whose watchword would be the survival of the poorest all around the world. And what I got was abuse from many people because I wanted to halt arms supplies to Saudi Arabia. 
but the policy was there and I was proud to include it in our manifesto in both the general elections in which I led the party. Because we cannot pretend to be in favour of human rights, peace and justice around the world if at the same time we're providing the wherewithal for the war that Saudi Arabia and others are waging against the people of Yemen. And so let's demand an end to those arms supplies as quickly as we possibly can. And that means recognizing the effects of those arms sales and also in the longer term developing an arms conversion policy so that those highly skilled people that make weapons are able to use those skills to make other things. How much better to be making medical equipment, railway equipment, transport equipment, all that, which we would happily send to Yemen rather than the bombs that are killing people. And so when people say, well, that's all very well, but we have to take sides in a conflict. No, you don't. The side you have to take is the side of the people and ensure that the world understands what's going on. Now, our media have been a bit slow to report the war in Yemen, a bit slow to talk about the real humanitarian disaster that's going on there. And so it's up to us to raise the voice. What we're doing tonight, what's happening in Birmingham on Sunday, and what is happening in London later in August and in September. But I think we should be looking to some kind of global action on this, because when people understand what is happening in Yemen, it is by many, many degrees far worse than almost any other conflict anywhere in the world. I'm not trying to minimize conflicts in other places, but I'm just saying this is something that is unbelievably serious. But I would also urge people to spend some time examining the history of the region and of Yemen, because when you understand the history of a place, the way in which the lines were drawn on maps, the colonial inheritance, the um, interference in uh, newly elected independent governments many years ago, and the proxy wars that have been waged there, and the influence of uh, those that wish to get control of oil or any other natural resources, you begin to see a whole pattern there. So I hope that we can stand with the people of Yemen, understand the history, understand what they're going through, give whatever aid and support we personally can through fundraising efforts. That is obviously something that is very important. But above all, make the political noise, the political demand that arms sales must cease now. The bombing must stop now. Because when a bomb supplied by Britain, as Amina was saying, with made in Britain, stamped on the side of it, destroys a school, a hospital, a house, kills civilians going about their normal day-to-day -day life, then it is this country that is behind that export. And so if we can force the British government to end arms supplies, then that will have a big effect and embolden our friends in the United States and other places to do exactly the same. So let's make that international call. And to everybody on the call tonight, Thank you for being on it. Thank you for spending your time standing up for the people of Yemen. And thank you to our other speakers for what they've done, what they've said tonight. Yourself, Shelley, Yasa, Steve, Amina. I think they've been incredibly well informed speakers. And that is the message we can get through solidarity with the people of Yemen. Stop the war, cease fire now, end arms supplies. Thank you. Thanks to you as well, Jeremy. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it was a fantastic speech, kind of touching on a lot of things. It was particularly good to hear about the, the health-related impacts of the war, which we kind of touched on earlier. Um, that of, so obviously a de deliberate um, form of warfare and really clear about what our demands are for an immediate end to arms sales and, and a peaceful solution, as well as what we need to replace the war machine. And it's particularly interesting to hear about that arms conversion policy, you know, using the skilled labour of those that are making bombs, redeploying that into socially useful production. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the lack of media attention and the need for global action at the end there, because I have a, a 
couple of questions for the panel on both those issues. Um, but just firstly, there's, there's a few announcements that I just want to uh, plug. So there's a protest in Birmingham on Sunday, uh, 2nd of August, 1pm in Victoria Square. You'll be able to find out more information on Stop the Walk. Stop the Wars website um, and we're also going to be working with Yemeni activists um, and organisations to call a protest in early September in London as well so again watch out for Stop the Wars social media and website for information on that and again it's been great to see people plugging uh, to join Stop the War in the, in the chat please if you can if you're not already a member please do support us and allow us to keep doing the kind of events like this and the protests that we organise all throughout the year and um, I'm also really pleased that in, a, in an upcoming event that we've got a uh, jazz saxophone supremo Shabaka Hutchins will be performing a new composition exclusively online for Stop the War next Thursday uh, 6th of August and it's, it's uh, to mark the 75th anniversary of the dropping of the nuclear bomb in Hiroshima please do tune in for that i think it's going to be a fantastic event and um, it just goes to show that we don't just do protests and, and meetings like this but we also have really important cultural events as well um, so moving on to questions now i had uh, questions from two people actually one in germany and one in france who ask about um, what kind of international alliances can be built between anti-war activists globally, so here in the UK and, and elsewhere, particularly when our own governments are our allies. So that's one question about um, international alliances. Um, I'm going to ask three questions and then I'll come to each of you to kind of touch on one or more um, of, of your choosing. Another question um, from Jesse, and it says um, it, it's increasingly becoming difficult to talk about Yemen um, as Saudis are tightening their hold on British media um, from the independent and the evening standard being directly owned by the Saudis, for example. How do we overcome that? Um, and another one from Murad, which um, says, um, do you think the Football Association's imminent approval of the Saudi purchase of Newcastle United should be stopped as a result of the Saudi regime's continued war in Yemen and human rights abuses? So I'm going to come to you, Steve, if that's OK, um, to pick up on any one or more of those questions. OK. Um on the issue of um, international alliances, relatively early in the war, um, the Stop the War was able to support an international conference in um, London in August 2016, which uh, was bilingual, Arabic and uh, uh, English, and um, had speakers from um, Yemen, Kuwait, Iraq, and, and so on, plus uh, speakers on link from Yemen itself. Stop the War has organized um, actions uh, dur during the war, but we have to say that it's been very difficult. It's been hard going. However, exactly because of the, as Amina indicates, the resistance and persistence of the Yemeni people um, and their refusal to be pushed aside by the invaders, so we are now getting to a position where the possibility of effective national action and the possibility of coordinated international action is real. And I very much welcome Jeremy's suggestion about an international day of action. We, all get that we were involved in an international day of action in 2016, but exactly the forces involved were much smaller um, then. And so it's entirely possible to coordinate international uh, action certainly the stop the war office will take all international queries and all uh, suggestions from um, su supporters across the globe very seriously indeed and stop the war has a record of coordinating international events so it's entirely possible it's in our hands fantastic thanks steve uh, isa can i come to you next Yeah, sorry, I just have a bit of trouble trying to unmute the mic. <laughs> but yeah, um, thanks, Mira, for your question about do you think the panel of the F uh, Football Association imminent approval of Saudi purchase of Newcastle United should be stopped as a result of Saudi regime's continued war in Yemen and killing of dissidents abroad as not being fit and proper to run the club? The simple answer is yes, because how could you put, how could you put that kind of power on, on something so widely spread with love 
onto something that's been has a background of um, such dark, um, such dark manner. Your the killing of people in Yemen and of women and children should not be used as a as a dark factor on behind the scenes of something that's so um, found upon like a football association. So the simple answer really is just yes. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Fantastic answer as well. You know, it, it's so true. Football is such a thing of love and uh, to bring to bring that into it. Uh, OK, um, Amina, can I come to you next and then we'll finish with Jeremy before I move on to some more questions? Yeah, um, I'm just going to answer what I do now. Um, so um, I was just looking at some of the questions and some people were saying, how do we get contact with journalists based in Yemen? I did put out a Twitter post, so you're more than welcome to look on my Twitter, where I asked all the Yemeni journalists to tag themselves. Um, there are, they are very easy to find if you type in on Google. That's the best way I can recommend. Um, I just want to share one example how you can send aid to Yemen without um, aid being weaponized. Um, or being given to, to the to the wrong people. Um, in Liverpool, um, we um, well not myself, um, activists, um, neighbours, friends started to raise money for a hot, um, a children's hospital called a Sabrine Hospital. And for the last four to five years, they've been monthly sending money to Yemen, and that money has been basically keeping the hospital alive. Um, and I was just thinking, on an international level, if every city in the UK was to support one hospital in Yemen, that would make a massive, massive difference to Yemen. Um, in terms of sending aid, um, my family and myself have always sent money directly. So we have contacts directly to Yemeni people and we send them to them to directly distribute it. Um, and um, what was the other question? <laughs> I forgot. Is so building international alliances is the football question, but don't feel don't feel like you have to comment on everything. That's absolutely fine. It's just pick up on one thing. I did want to just say about um, the best way we can do is social media. Um, a few weeks back, we had celebrities and loads of social influencers sharing about Yemen for the first time. A lot of people were saying it was a bit too late, but it's better than never. Um, so do keep sharing. Um, do remember that social media is a global interaction. The Yemeni people on the ground are directly seeing the work that you do and it gives them a lot of hope. Um, it really does. So keep sharing, keep talking about it, challenge your MP, sign letters and hopefully, hopefully our British government can. And also please support Campaign Against the Arms Trade. I've been involved with them for the past three years and they've been making some really, really incredible work. And, and of course, Stop the World Coalition. Thank you. Thanks, Amina. Over to you, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, I'll be very quick because we need to get time for other questions to come in. And I think my uh, fellow panelists have given very good answers already. Uh, thanks for the questions from uh, France and Germany. This is why I made the suggestion of an international day of action, which Steve picked up on also. Obviously, it will take a little time to organise that. So I would have thought we need to put our heads together on doing something September time, um, where we ask people to make take action all around the world. I remember the power of the action we took in 2003 against the um, imminent war in Iraq. We had um, 600 demonstrations all over the world that day. Now, it didn't stop the war. It didn't stop Britain being involved in the war, but it did deny the legitimacy of that war. And it did persuade a number of governments to change their minds and not participate in, in that conflict. Let's have that day of action in support of the people of Yemen and an end to arms supplies, which are obviously fueling the conflict. Um, the strength of Saudi Arabia and its financial interest in Britain is absolutely huge, as Jesse pointed out in her question and Murad did in his. And, um, Having met uh, Newcastle United supporters, um, people who were concerned about uh, Mike Ashley and his ownership of the club, the way it was run, they were absolutely brilliant people. They were collecting money for food banks. They were collecting money for refugees. They were giving support to people um, in the most difficult circumstances. Football supporters do give support to an awful lot of people in lots of ways. And it's fantastic that outside uh, Anfield is food banks. So let's um, remember the decency and humanity of um, 
many, many people, millions of people who support football. Therefore, the challenge over the uh, transfer of ownership of Newcastle to um, a Saudi-based company gives us the opportunity to heighten the whole issue of arms sales to Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia's participation in the war, indeed occupation uh, of Yemen that, that is going on. And so I think when we do our event in September, let's have that in mind so that we can popularize and expand the base of people who are terrified uh, and frightened of what is happening in Yemen but also give huge support to the Yemeni community here. Amina um, and everyone in, in Liverpool is doing fantastic work in raising practical help and support for schools and hospitals in Yemen but it would be a lot easier if we weren't bombing Yemen at the same time and so uh, I think we should also make sure that all of our local groups that activate themselves also raise money for humanitarian help and support. There are plenty of agencies able to deliver, UNICEF, Oxfam and so on are all doing, doing stuff there but we have to get involved in it as well. Thank you Jeremy. I've got a lot of people asking about when the next protests are, so just a reminder there is one happening this Sunday in Birmingham and some details are being posted in the chat box but I'll make sure that they're posted again in there for you. So if you are living in the Midlands and are able to make it along, please do. And as I said earlier, there is one being organised for early September in London as well. So just uh, if you sign up to the Stop the War mailing list, that's probably the best way to keep in touch in general but also find out you know, what app actions are, are taking place that you can get involved in. I'm just going to ask two questions now to finish off because we've not we've not got too long um, until we need to finish. Um, there's been a few questions about the role of divestment campaigns um, and I know that there's been a few that are particularly effective and um, Amina mentioned the campaign against the arms trade as well but particularly um, students taking action. I know at my own university at Leeds last year um, they, they decided to divest from three arms manufacturers um, and that was as a, was as a result of um, direct uh, campaigning by students, particularly the Palestine's uh, solidarity campaign um, student group on campus. So what can people do to um, not just campaign against the government selling weapons but also um, companies and organisations such as educational institutions that are complicit um, in investing in, in arms manufacturers as well. And then the final question is, what is the most promising route to a peaceful solution? I'm going to mix up the order this time, and I'm going to come to Issa first. That's all right with you, Issa? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Um, well, so when it comes to peaceful um, ways of disarming a situation such as this, the best way to do it is through organizations that are dealing with protests and marches and going about it in a peaceful manner, showing the light across the situation in Yemen, but also making sure that we are staying kind of content and peaceful within ourselves as well. It's the best way to make sure that some that um, our message and our word is getting across, whilst also making sure that we are staying peaceful. Um, in, in an answer to the other question as well, I'd say, obviously there are a lot of, um, investors in these kind of things such as like the base systems and rolls royce and universities that are contributing obviously their their loans are obviously and their fees are contributing into this um into this um expense for the government in order to for their help and creating these um these companies such as bay and rolls royce are creating these big big things and obviously I know a lot of people want to do certain peaceful things when it comes to boycotting and stuff like that but the best way to go about it is is with the second question of making sure that everyone stays peaceful really and obviously going through these correct means of making sure that they are properly properly spreading awareness with peaceful manners. Thanks Issa. Steve if I can ask you those two questions. Uh, in terms of the uh, divestment uh, campaign, I think it, groups in particular want to focus on British aerospace um, that is, and the possibility of uh, you know, protests outside uh, British aerospace. Um, that is probably the largest um, investor in the war. Uh, in terms of a private uh, company, the BAE have 7,000 employees in Saudi Arabia sustaining the, um, the Saudi Air Force, including its bombing uh, uh, campaign. 
Now, um, you, I think activists would need to contact local union, unions and so on in such uh, establishments. But the aim is not the workers, the aim is to highlight government policy and the particular fact that um, there are grotesque profits being made out of the misery of uh, the Yemeni people. In terms of the route to a peaceful solution, we have to be realistic. This is a very ferocious war and that the material interests that people have in this, particularly um, the um, in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, but also the ruling circles in this country and the United States. They are heavily invested in this war. It's difficult for them to recognize their failure. So the most effective and peaceful route depends upon our persistence and above all on our capacity to organize united activity. We need to grow our movement through coordination at every stage to take our actions into our communities, into our faith organizations, into our workplaces, into the student unions, and so on and so on. We can all do something. Let us do it together. That is the sure route. Thanks, Steve. Really important point there about building those coalitions in, in local communities. I mean, if I can come to you for any final remarks, but also anything you might have to say about the divestment campaigns and the most promising route to a peaceful solution. Um, I'm, I'm going to just give something a little bit different. Um, um, I think we need to now take legal action. I campaign against the arms trade already to delay, you know, um, succeeded in London and the arms trade, but however, um, a few weeks ago, um, it, it was passed as an, um, an isolated incident. Um, so I think we need to continue to take legal action against our government. This is against the law. Um, and second of all, support uh, people that are doing that as well. I think also joining forces with our American non-Yemeni and Yemeni activists. So one organisation is the Yemen Committee Alliance, who recently we've connected with from Britain, and we're doing webinars online talking about what they're doing, what we're doing. And I think it's just it's just a lot more. There's a lot more power if we join forces because I always believe where America goes. UK follows. Um, so definitely joining forces. Um, and we also have a group called the Labour Friends of Yemen. Um, it was set up last year, so please do join us. Um, it just makes us a lot more stronger and we can obviously uh, speak in the language of uh, politics. Um, great. <laughs> Thanks, Amina. That's a good plug for anyone who's a member of the Labour Party. And it's really great to hear that those conversations between activists here and activists in the States are already happening. So that's a good answer to the question earlier about building those global alliances. OK, just to finish off the discussion, Jeremy, if you've got anything to say about uh, on those last uh, couple of questions and any closing remarks, please. Thanks, Shelley. And thank you, everyone, for being on it and the very positive and interesting comments that are in the chat box. It's quite hard to keep up with them all when they float across the screen in front of you, but I've just been looking at them now. And there are a lot of very good and very helpful ideas there. So thank you all very much indeed. And the strange thing is that the Corona crisis is obviously disastrous for many people around the world and um, has taken a lot of lives. What it's also done is made us contact each other much more and so pre-corona I suspect a meeting like this would have been a meeting in a hall somewhere and we would have spoken and there might have been two three four hundred people there or something like that um, but we wouldn't necessarily have had the um, diversity of location uh, because obviously getting to a meeting is more difficult so I think we should just remember the power of contacting each other by this system should not be just given up when coronas is over. We should remember that we do have the ability to mobilize people very, very quickly. And that's why I think we need to put our heads together of how we're going to organize a, a global event um, in, a, in a month or two's time, because that is very important to do. Secondly, the issue of divestment campaigns and arms industry are very, very important. And um, that means um, 
those involved in pension fund investigation, uh, investment rather, um, and those involved in um, student union activities and others can use that as a very important tool of saying, we're not prepared to have our funds used to um, for supply weaponry to, um, weaponry to bomb the people of Yemen. I think that's a very important thing to do. The um, priority root of what we do at the present time to try and bring about peace in Yemen has to be the practical acts of solidarity like supporting hospitals, supporting schools, giving our own aid, as has been done in other conflicts around the world. But above all, it has to be the big one, which is the supply of weapons by Britain, the United States and some other places. Um, and uh, confront the argument that some or other, if we didn't supply the weapons, somebody else would. Well, there's always somebody that will try and do something nasty. But it's up to us to unite to make sure that doesn't happen. And that means um, uniting internationally to force our own governments to put a ban on all arms sales to Saudi Arabia, which have been used as part of this campaign for bombardment of Yemen. Last thing I'd say is this. Global reactions to things are now very, very fast much faster than the mainstream uh, media can keep up with. And so we used to be reliant on um, the international media channels, um, CNN, Sky, um, Fox News, etc., to um, decide on a message around the world. There's now a much wider diversity of it. There's um, following stuff on Al Jazeera, as well as the um, more traditional channels, BBC and so on. But we actually have our own methods of communication through social media and what we're doing this evening, and that's important. Think of how quickly the whole world reacted to the death in the United States of George Floyd by one police officer. And that gave a massive impetus to Black Lives Matter's movement all around the world. And that movement isn't going to stop, isn't going to go away. I believe it's only going to grow. And we need to move into a world of humanitarian values rather than military values. And that is surely something that we can help to promote by our actions in supporting the people of Yemen and the peace that they need and deserve. Can we just give our support and sympathy and solidarity to the people of Yemen and to the many Yemeni communities all around this country, indeed all around the world, for the suffering they're going through. And what I detected when I met many of them in Liverpool as well as other places is sadly a sense of isolation. Let's end that isolation. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight, all the speakers. You've all been fantastic, inspiring, so informative. And I feel very, very lucky to have joined you on this panel. And I'm really grateful to everybody who's joined to watch tonight. We've had hundreds of people on Zoom alone. I don't know how many people were watching through Facebook and other means as well. And I'm sure people will watch back once this gets uploaded to YouTube. I've seen some people asking, will it be, it will be uh, available online after. So you can go back and watch it or share it with your friends and just a final plug to say we've got a fantastic event coming up where we've got um, Shabaka Hutchings who is a saxophonist who's going to be performing on the 6th of August please uh, visit our website and find out more about that there's a protest this Sunday in Birmingham um, in support of Yemen against uh, Britain arming Saudi um, and please just to plug again if you're not a member of Stop the War Coalition please visit our website join today your membership helps sustain the work that we do and it helps grow the anti-war movement in this country thanks again to everybody who's spoken solidarity to you all uh, and have a wonderful evening I hope to see you soon thank you